All right, good morning. Today we're going to go over chapter 14, which is shock. And then after that, we'll get into introduction of the skill sheet for IV. So we're not actually doing IVs today. So it's just the introduction of IV medication administration. And I'm probably pediatric IOs. So we'll cover those skill sheets and just run through them. Let's see. Ah. There we go. All right. So today's shock, shock is a state of basically the cardiovascular system is just collapsing. It's just for whatever reason, for multiple different reasons, it's just starting to fail. Um, body attempts to maintain its homeostasis in the early stages of shock, but then it goes in, and that's the compensating stage. And then once it gets to a certain point, the breaking point, it's going to go into the decompensating phase. And then like just about everything, at some point, it's going to eventually cease. And shock can occur because of medical or traumatic events. number of different things. We'll cover that. And we're going to go over some of the signs and symptoms of shock. So shock physiology. Basically, the physiology is in perfusion is the circulation of blood within the organ and tissue in adequate amounts. So it's, it's dependent on having multiple different things working in its favor. The, the pump's got to be working properly, the pipes have got to be working properly, and then the fluid in the body's got to be adequate. Cardiac output is the volume of blood, heart, the heart, yes, the volume of blood the heart can pump per minute. So that's the cardiac output. So a couple of these are going to be terms that are in the book that you need to pay attention to because at some point you're probably going to be tested on them. So cardiac output, it's the myocardial contractility and it requires a good preload and afterload. The cardiac output is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. Okay, and then blood pressure is equal to the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. MAP, mean arterial pressure, is the diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. Another way of figuring that out is the diastolic times two plus the systolic divided by three. Right? Uh, so two o'clock in the morning, when you're trying to figure it out, just look at the monitor. It'll tell you. <laughs> This is going to come into play, though, as it relates to perfusion. This is actually, ultimately, this is what we're looking for. Instead of just the blood pressure number and 90 over 50 or 100 over 60, ultimately what we're more concerned about with perfusion is going to be MAP because that correlates to organ perfusion. So that's what MAP, why MAP is important. Diastolic time, two times the diastolic plus the systolic divided by three. Or diastolic plus one third of the pulse pressure, which is systolic minus diastolic. Got it. So whatever. So a couple different ways. Okay. The autonomic nervous system controls the cardiovascular system. It regulates from the upper part of the medulla oblongata What's wrong with his medulla? Sympathetic nervous system prepares body for physical activity during a stressful situation. The parasympathetic is the nervous system in re is responsible for rest and regeneration. So when do we see the parasympathetic? When does that really take effect? When's a good, huh? Okay, so but for rest and regeneration, when is that? So typically when we're asleep? Okay. Picture the body. So pupils can get dilated, arteries constrict, lungs start relax, the bronchioles start relaxing, GI tract slows down, the heart rate increases, 
The other side of that is going to be the constricting of pupils, lungs not affected, arteries not affected, GI is increased salivation. So what are these examples of? The sympathetic and parasympathetic, is these, these are the sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? Regulation of blood flow is controlled by the sphincters in the, in the pipes. So sphincters regulate the blood flow through the capillary, all the way into the capillary beds, and it helps determine, is, is determined by the cellular need. So whatever the, the need is by that cell will control uh, those sphincters, help control those sphincters, open them up to allow more flow or close them down for less flow. Accomplished by vessel constriction or dilation. So again, at constricting or dilating to allow the flow. And maintenance of the perfusion is accomplished by heart, blood vessels, and the blood working all together. So it's a complete system. Respiration and oxygenation. Oxygenation is the blood where the blood passes through the alveolar wall into the pulmonary capillary. So there's a difference between respirations and ventilations, right? So make sure you understand the difference as far as the terminology. Diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood, and then you get carbonic acid breaks. Uh, the carbonic acid breaks down in lungs and the carbon dioxide is exhaled. So just an overview of obviously the lungs and how that functions. So shock can result from several different things, right? So inadequate cardiac output or a decrease in stroke volume, right? Is that SVR, stroke volume? Systemic yeah, systemic, uh, sorry, S -s systemic vascular response. Inability, right? Resistance. Resistance. <sighs> Got it. Uh, inability of the red blood cells to deliver oxygen, and the body attempts to compensate by shunting blood flow from more of the tolerant organs to vital organs. So some of that tolerant flow from like say the skin, intestines to the vital organs, so it's shunting over to the heart, brain, lungs, etc. The systemic circulation, so you have the heart, we all know the heart, the workup, pause, the uh, oxygenated blood, bless you, comes out of the aorta, circulates through the system at the top and at the bottom here. And at the capillaries, it exchanges. You get the CO2, it goes back through the ventricles, goes through the heart, goes out to the lungs, and then comes back as oxygenated blood from the lungs. It requires the heart to have a proper pump function. So any damage to the heart can decrease uh, decrease the ability of this. Blood vessels have to function properly. So again, if you have uh, a sudden dilation of vessels, you're going to affect the perfusion. And obviously you need to have good blood in the vessels. Enough blood or plasma loss, the, the volume of fluid in the container is not enough to support the perfusion needs of the body. So that's where we get like um, not enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen and other nutrients like anemia. So that's where you might have that patient who is really pale. And then you're going to get poor SpO2 sets when you're trying to get those with the finger probe. Blood is the vehicle for carrying oxygen and nutrients. Again, this is just a lot of this is just re recovering and and just reiterating some of the stuff. So blood carries the oxygen and the nutrients, and then it carries the carbon dioxide back out, right? And some of the the bad stuff contains red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. It has a factor in blood clotting, controls the blood loss, and is formed depending on retention of the blood, which changes in the, uh, the vessel wall and the blood's ability to clot. Body's neural and hormonal mechanisms are triggered by 
body senses falling pressure. So the sympathetic nervous system assumes more control of the body's function during a state of shock. Parasympathetic nervous system controls involuntary functions by sending signals to the cardiac, smooth, and granular muscles. And it takes over during non-stressful situations. Also, a shifting of body fluids, uh, a shifting of body fluids to help maintain pressure within the system. Compensation for a decrease in perfusion. So the body's natural, it's trying to get that homeostasis. Baroreceptors sense a decrease in blood pressure and flow. The chemoreceptors measures the shifts of the amounts of carbon dioxide in the blood. So remember those, those two different receptors and, and what their functions are. So the baroreceptors sense the decreased blood pressure and flow. Chemoreceptors measures shifts in the amounts of carbon dioxide in the blood. And these are stimulated. Uh, stimulation occurs when the systolic pressure is between 60 and 80 milligrams of mercury in adults and even lower in children. Remember, because some children have will typically have a lower blood pressure. Hypoperfusion. Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system activates release of the antidiuretic hormone. So then initial compensatory mechanisms increase preload, the stroke volume, and then ultimately the pulse rate to help compensate, right? So auto transfusion effect allows body to compensate for a volume less, uh, loss all the way up to 25%. So once it gets beyond that, things, things start changing for the worse. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Hypoperfusion. If it persists, can ultimately cause myocardial, myocardial function issues. So your heart muscle, the heart, it's going to end up causing issues. You're going to cause issues with tissue perfusion. You're going to have a decrease, so they're not going to be able to function properly. You're going to have leaks of fluid in from the blood vessels. So that's where you're going to get the uh, pedal edema and the pulmonary edema because the fluid is, is leaking out because the heart's not pumping right. Perfusion of the brain and coronary arteries decrease, so you're going to get that altered mentation, that encephalopathy. They're not acting right. Cells switch to anaerobic metabolism from the aerobic metabolism. So the aerobic metabolism, remember, is when there's enough oxygen. As soon as the body doesn't have enough oxygen, it's going to go into that anaerobic phase, and that's what is happening with if hypoperfusion persists. And then production of the epinephrine and, and norepinephrine are affected. And that's in the adrenal glands in response to the hypoperfusion. There's a pecking order to the body. So as hypoperfusion starts and then continues, the body is going to try to compensate, right? And it's going to plan. It, it does it on its own. It's, it's the way we're made. It's the way we're designed. That the shunting of the blood is going to go from areas that don't need it as much as, so like again, like the tissues, like the skin, to uh, shunt it towards the vital organs. Failure of the compensatory mechanisms to preserve perfusion result in the decreases of preload and cardiac output. Okay. And that's where we need to be concerned with this is going to be in that, that golden hour, right? This, this is going to be within that golden hour that we need to be – watching out for the signs of hypoperfusion and try to mitigate. Shock-related events in capillary and microcirculatory levels. The cellular ischemia occurs with decreased perfusion. Anaerobic metabolism, again, it switches from aerobic to anaerobic. 
You're going to have acidosis. Acidosis serves as an indirect measure of tissue perfusion. And dysfunction of the sodium, you're going to have a dysfunction of that sodium-potassium pump. You're going to have a reduced level of ATP resulting in the dysfunction of that sodium-potassium pump. And the anaerobic metabolism results in systemic acidosis and depletion of the body's normal high energy reserves. Incomplete glucose breakdown results in an accumulation of the pyruvic acid. Capillary and microcirculatory levels. Cellular flood, uh, cellular flooding releases lys lysosomes, lysosomal enzymes. Um, lysosomal enzymes are auto digest the cell, leading to organ failure. So it's going to digest the the cells. Reduced blood supply to the vasomotor center of the brain results in slowing and stopping of sympathetic nervous systems. Continuing buildup of the lactic acid. And the carbon dioxide acts as a potent vasodilator. So your vessel is going to open up, which is also, so you still have the same amount of fluid potentially in the body, but now your vessels open up, which is going to cause a drop in your blood pressure, continued drop. And in conjunction with all this injury occurring, white blood cells and blood clotting systems are impaired. And you're going to have the disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC, which may occur. So it's going to have an impact on the clotting. You're going to possibly get blood clotting on the inside of the, the vessels. And DIC has also been found in complicated septic shock. MODS, or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, it's combined failure of several organs. So multiple organs, more than two, two or more. Is there a book tell, give a... Two or more? Several. Several. So more than two. Occurs when injury or, or infection results in release of numerous inflammatory mediators. And we're typically, we're going to see this more so in sepsis. Activated of complement, uh, of complement system, coagulation system, and the Kinnan system. And I looked that up last night and... Don't remember. Oh, that has to do with the so hormones and proteins. Kinin. Yeah, Kinnan. It's uh, the release of Brady Kinnan, a potent vasodilator resulting in tissue hypoperfusion. Okay. I've never seen that word before, but it's probably going to be on the test then. So <laughs> pay attention to that one. So. This all this typically develops within hours to days following resuscitation. Some of the signs and symptoms that you're looking for with MOZ is going to be hypotension, insufficient tissue perfusion. They're going to have uncontrolled breathing or uncontrolled bleeding. So they're going to be bleeding from different areas within the tissue or maybe from other area, from other locations. Multiple uh, system organ failure caused by the hypoxia. Again, remember, because the body is starting to shunt, it's going to start taking oxygen and good blood from, from some of the organs that don't necessarily need it and put it to the more important organs. So you're going to start getting different organ failures, and it's going to start progressing. Tissue acidosis, because it's not able to... It doesn't have enough oxygen, so you're going to get that lactic acid buildup and severe local oh, and carbon dioxide, and you're going to have several or severe local alterations of metabolism. Respiratory insufficiency. Your insufficient concentration of oxygen in the blood can produce shock. Poisoning can affect ability to, of cells to metabolize or carry oxygen. And anemia is going to have the abnormally low number of red blood cells. So you're not going to be able to have enough. It's not going to have enough red blood cells to carry uh, oxygen to the cells. Uh, 
Um, so remember that without oxygen, obviously, the organs can't, we can't survive. The organs can't survive. Tissues are not going to survive. Going to get that buildup of carbon monoxide poisoning within the uh, tissues that Poisoning may affect ability of cells to metabolize and carry oxygen. So you're going to get carbon monoxide, uh, potentially carbon monoxide poisoning can build up. Uh, cyanide poisoning is um, can be a factor because those displace oxygen, right? So you, you, the cells aren't going to metabolize. And with that anemia, the other other issue with that too uh, may be a result of either chronic or acute bleeding. So you might have those patients who have like uh, uh, Crohn's disease or some other intestinal ulcers and things that internal bleeding where it's going to affect their red blood cell count. Questions on pathophysiology, kind of the overview. Online, you guys. I'm going to say um a few more times. Um. Okay. So let's get into causes of shock. Causes of shock is going to be typically one of a few different things. So the pump's going to either failing, you have low fluid, or you have poor vessels. So it's one of, typically one of those. As a result of bleeding, respiratory failure, acute allergic reactions, or an infection. So with the pump failure, it's obviously it's because of possible heart attack, trauma to the heart, obstructive causes like pulmonary embolism, the low fluid volume as a result of trauma, fluid loss in like the uh, GI tract, uh, or from the GI tract, like from vomiting or diarrhea. So we get those patients who have been sick with the flu and they just vomit. They've been vomiting for several days. They've got, they've got the squirts and uh, they're just losing fluid that way on a, on a frequent basis. So yeah, these patients are going to be dehydrated, right? So they're, they have not enough fluid. And then with poor vaso, uh, vessel function as a result of infections, overdoses like narcotics, spinal cord injury, spinal and anaphylaxis. You expect shock if a patient has multiple uh, fractures. So expect it because, again, those, the bones are uh, vascular. And when the bones break, they're potentially going to lose uh, fluid. Remember the, the long bones, so they've got the, the femurs especially, can lose, what, like 1,500 cc's of fluid, blood into the legs when those are fractured. So just remember they're going to lose quite a bit of, of fluid. Abdominal or chest injuries, spinal, severe infection, major heart attacks, and anaphylaxis all potentially can uh, you expect shock if you have a patient with, with these issues. Types of shock are going to include hypovolemia which is shock due to inadequate blood volume. Hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic causes of hypovolemic shock can be a factor. You're going to have non-hemorrhagic shock, which occurs when the fluid loss is contained within the body. So the fluid, is, the fluid is basically moved out of the vessels into another area. So like your edemas with uh, pedal edema, um, uh, pulmonary edema. So you still have the fluid. It's in the body, but it's not in the proper vessels. It's not in the right locations. Abnormal losses of fluids and electrolytes through dehydration, again, through like people with the flu, been nausea, vomiting, diarrhea for several days. You're going to have uh, gastrointestinal losses of that fluid. You're gonna have, they're going to have increased sweating and excessive sweating because they're running that fever, right? So their body is trying to fight whatever bug it is. So they're going to be, uh, the body temperature is going to increase. They're going to have a lot of sweating. So they're losing fluids that way. 
Internal losses due to peritonitis or pancreatitis or ileus, 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 ileus. I'm not too familiar with that one. Plasma losses from burns, drains, and granulating wounds. So that's a big one when we come when it burns. Um, we that's why it's it's important for us to get those fluids onto those patients uh, quickly. And there's the Parkland formula. There's another formula out there, uh, modified Parkland for burn patients. Other causes include ascites, diabetes insipidus, and osmotic diuresis secondary to hyperosmolarity states. Okay. Earliest signs of shock are restlessness and anxiety. So that's what we're going to see with these patients. They're going to be amped up, maybe. They're going to feel that sense of, of anxiety because they're just not feeling right. They might have a sudden uh, thirst. They're, they're getting thirsty. Their mouth is dry. They're going to be pale, cool, clammy. Their heart speeds up to try to compensate for the drop in blood pressure. And as bleeding or fluid loss continues, that blood pressure is going to continue to fall. With this, I mean, we don't want to wait, right? When we need to, the most important thing for us as Presley pre-hospital is recognizing the signs and symptoms of shock and then treating it. That's the, that's the big piece for us. You recognize it, treat it, because again, if it goes untreated, things are going to get worse. They're going to go into that decompensated phase. Uh, the goal in treating shock ultimately is going to be to save the brain, lung, uh, lungs, and kidneys. The whole body, but those are the, the big three that the book talks about. Cardiogenic shock is caused by inadequate function of the heart. So the heart has got an obstruction possibly. Develops when the heart cannot maintain sufficient output. Could be with the edema, presence of abnormally large amounts of fluid between the cells in body tissues. So the pulmonary edema results in impaired ventilation. For blood to circulate efficiently, there must be the right amount of pressure and an adequate number of heartbeats. So everything has to coincide. Cardiogenic shock develops when the heart cannot maintain sufficient output to meet the demands of the body. As afterload increases, cardiac output decreases. And it may result from low cardiac output due to high afterload, low preload, poor contractility, or any combination of the three. Obstructive shock is a result of conditions that cause mechanical obstruction of cardiac muscle also affect the pump function. So your cardiac tamponade, tension pneumos, and pulmonary embolism. So tension pneumo. So you have the buildup of air right in the, in the thoracic cavity that is preventing that heart from getting that full, full pumping going on. So it's affecting the, the heart function. Heart and respiratory rates increase and become shallower. You're going to get that narrowing of uh, pulse pressures. Blood pressure decreases. So with pulmonary embolism, remember that's the blood clot that occurs in the pulmonary circulation. So can prevent blood from being pumped from the right side of the heart to the left. Right side of the heart to the left. Distributive shock is a result when there is a widespread dilation of the small arterioles and small venules. Septic shock is a result of severe infections. So that would be your example of distributive shock. So you have the normal vessel, and with the increase of either a spinal injury or septic shock, you're going to get that dilating vessel with the absence of sweating. For the spinal shock, you're going to have the dilating vessel, absence of sweating, and loss of body temperature control. Spinal. Sh 
Septic shock occurs as a result of severe infection. We know that, usually bacterial. Toxins damage the vessel walls, causing an increased cellular permeability. And the presence, similarly to the hemorrhagic shock, um, you're going to have the weak thready pulse. So when you're trying to feel the radial, it's going to be weak and thready. So it's going to be real weak, and it's going to be real rapid. It's going to be hard to tell exactly what rate it is. Shallow, rapid respiration. So you're going to have those respirations greater than 20, um, probably closer to 26 to 30. Altered mentation, so that encephalopathy, they're going to be altered. They're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. And they're going to either be warm or hot skin. And in those, uh, some of the late signs of shock, they're actually going to have cold skin. Neurogenic shock is a result due to damage of the nerve system that controls the size and muscular tone of the vessels. Muscles in the walls of the blood vessels are cut off from the sympathetic nervous system and nerve impulses that cause them to contract. So all vessels below that spinal injury dilate widely, increasing size and capacity of the vascular system. So kind of like with this picture here. Yeah, and you're going to have uh, the absence of sweating below that level of inj injury. You're going to have normal or warm skin signs and lack of an elevated pulse. And finally, anaphylactic and psychogenic. Anaphylactic shock occurs when the person's reactions reacts violently to a substance in which he or she has been sensitized. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's the first time that they got the bee sting or ate that shellfish. Um, it could happen after the fact. So they maybe they've never had that reaction before, but all of a sudden now they're having that reaction. Results in a widespread base, uh, vascular dilation, increased permeability, and bronchoconstriction. So you're going to end up getting that wheezing effect. So you're going to hear the wheezing. You're going to have difficulty breathing. Injections from bee stings, ingestions can cause uh, whatever can cause like shellfish uh, and inhalations, different inhalations can cause that anaphylactic shock. I uh, end up having a uh, reaction. I, I have pretty bad uh, seasonal allergies and hay fever and all that. And we were on a wildland fire out on the prairie in one of those wheat fields. And just the smoke, me inhaling that, that smoke from that wheat field, I end up having uh, wheezing, throat was starting to swell up, I started getting hives, so it's that in inhalation. I didn't have to have the effects in, just in the eyes, but actually inhaling that smoke, it made me pretty sick um, and started getting weak. So, yeah, something to think about. Psychogenic shock. So it's a body's reaction when, typically when they get, like somebody gets hurt and they have a sudden reaction uh, to that injury. Doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the injury is actually, the actual injury is causing the shock, but it's their kind of the response to that injury. Um, nervous system that produces temporary generalized vascular dilation resulting in fainting. So what would be a good example of psychogenic shock that we might see in somebody who's about to get an IV? Somebody who's going to get an IV, right? Sight of blood or that the feeling of that needle going in the arm. They All of a sudden they get that, they get pale and they feel like they're going to pass out. Okay. Uh, the patient has sudden reaction. Causes of syncope that are potentially life-threatening as a result of events such as an irregular heartbeat or a brain aneurysm can also... I get that's under psychogenic shock. Questions on the different shocks? Different types? Perfect. Anaphylactic, let's see, we've covered that. So shock occurs in two successive stages. You have decompensated, or you have compensated and then decompensated shock. Compensate is going to be the early stage of shock. It's where the chemo, uh, chemical mediators are released by the atomic uh, 
autonomic nervous system. Your pulse pressure equals the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. So that's where you're going to hear terms like narrowing pulse pressures. Okay, so that number between those two numbers, the systolic and diastolic is getting closer and closer together. Compensated, it's, the body's still able to compensate for the blood loss. Decompensated is the late stage of shock. Blood volume decreases more than 30%. Compensatory mechanisms begin to fall. And then you actually get into irreversible shock, where shock that has progressed to a terminal stage, are so it's basically it's Johnny jacked up, it's going to be game over. Arterial blood vo uh, pressure is abnormally low. Life-threatening reductions in cardiac output, blood pressure, and tissue perfusion are, are starting to happen. That last piece on the irregular heartbeat and brain aneurysm, yeah, that was on the uh, neurogenic shock. Did I miss neurogenic shock? Okay, sorry, I got my pages crossed. All right, so that's compensated, decompensated, and irreversible. So it's not possible to distinguish irreversible shock from severe decompensated shock in the pre-hospital environment. That's not no way for us to really tell that. The distinction between decompensated shock and irreversible shock is made based on the failure of the shock state to reverse the appropriate treatments. Okay, there. Back on track. So all this boils down to we need to have a good patient assessment. We need to be looking at the scene size up, looking for and addressing any of the hazards and the threats to us first, to our partners, to bystanders, and to the patient. We need to do a good primary survey, looking for uh, any signs and symptoms on that patient, looking doing a full rapid body scan of the patient, identifying any and managing any immediate life threats. So that's in that top part of that skill sheet, identifying life threats, immediate life threats. So if you see that there's gross hemorrhage, you need to stop that bleeding, tourniquets, pressure. Stop that bleed before you can get to airway, right? So stop those life threats. Quickly assess the patient's breathing. All this is going to be rapid because if they're in this shock phase, we need to address that because we're within, hopefully, we're still within that golden hour and assess the patient's circulatory uh, status. Checking the heart rate, skin signs, perfusion, all that good stuff. Uh, checking for distal pulses. Again, you know, if you don't have that distal pulse where it's a, a, no pedal pulse, okay? Now, no radial pulse. All right, well, let's check a carotid pulse. Well, the carotid pulse is pretty weak. Well, this patient's probably pretty sick. Just assume that, right? Rapid pulse is going to suggest some type of a compensated shock. So you're going to maintain a high index of suspicion for occult injuries. Occult. If the patient shows signs of hypoperfusion, you need to gain IV access. Start getting aggressive with treatments and provide rapid transport. With this, you're going to also want to do what? Make sure you go back to BLS, maintain, put the patient in a supine position, and keep them warm, right? Try to keep them warm. Cover them with a the blanket. You need to make sure that you're doing a good history taking. Determine the chief complaint of that patient. Or if they're not complaining because they're altered, try to find out from bystanders or family what was going on prior to this. 
Be alert for any injury specific signs and symptoms. Try to make sure, try to obtain a sample history. Again, you may not be able to get it from the patient, but get it from the facility or from family or bystanders on scene. Pay attention to any blood thinners. If the, this patient is on blood thinners, because it's going to obviously make the bleeding injuries worse, especially if they're at that phase of bleeding on the inside. Life-threatening bleeding should be treated first again. Yep. Okay. Secondary assessment, very important, because once you get your primary assessment done, once you get your primary done, you need to, that's when you're doing your, your rapid scan, identifying what's really going on or what's going on. You need to go back and do your secondary where you're narrowing down the causes for what's going on. You're repeating the primary survey, so you're going back to making sure that there's no obvious life threats. And then your ABCs, vital signs. Start with a full body exam, obtain a complete set of baseline vitals, because you may not have got that in your primary. Again, I know in our system, we have enough people on scene, so even in a primary, we're getting some of those uh, baseline vitals during that, because somebody's there to do it. And you use a monitoring device to uh, quantify the patient's oxygen circulatory status. So using the monitor to check for SpO2 for entitel, and maybe even uh, you're using the monitor for your blood pressures. Reassess, determine any effects of interventions performed and the inter any interventions that are still needed. So again, this is gonna be going back to, I've got my IV established and I now I wanna go back and make sure that I'm getting an increase in, in pressure, okay? Making sure that we're getting oxygen on that patient. Is the oxygen and the IV actually helping and making this patient better? Are we getting an improved in SpO2? Are we getting an improved in skin signs and pulses and blood pressure? Focus on supporting the cardiovascular system. So again, it's that IV, rapid, a uh, lot of fluids. Patients in decompensated shock will need rapid interventions. So in decompensated, I'd maybe consider, make sure you're doing bilateral lines. Okay, so you got on scene, you got the, the initial line. Maybe take a second person with you during transport so that they can get a, help you get another line in route. Because again, this patient's going to need rapid transport. Treatments begin during the assessment process. Going to control all obvious external bleeding. So they're really hitting this to trying to really hit this point. Always control any external bleeding, obvious external bleeding. So this is a lot of this is the new, uh, new, uh, gosh, sorry, struggling with words. Um, Programs that are out there is the Stop the Bleed. So that's a big thing right now as well. So Stop the Bleed. Place the patient in the position dictated by local protocol for shock patients. So, you know, we used to really teach the Trendillenburg position, dropping the head, raising the feet, uh, just changing them from a sitting position down to a laying down position potentially is, is going to actually help your, your pressures. Make sure you're providing warmth, gain IV access. Again, running those fluids. Make sure you listen to lung sounds before you just flood them with fluid as well, okay? Make sure you're paying attention to lung sounds. And once you've administered those fluids, you need to go back and re-listen to lung sounds. You're trying to get all this done within that first 60 minutes of the injury, getting him to that definitive care within that golden hour. That's not what I want. That's what I want. So IV lines are inserted to provide routes of medication, routes of fluid, potential replacement in patients uh, at risk of losing substantial volumes of fluid. So you got those bleeds. We can't put tourniquets and stop the bleed on internal bleeding, right? So you got those uh, like intestinal bleeds, GI bleeds, uh, bleeds within the, the leg, say from a fractured bone. We can't really stop those. So you're going to need to be getting that patient rapid transport, 
try to replenish those fluids uh, with what we have, and then consider those IVs uh, for administering any medications. Protocol for IV medication or IV fluids. Remember that pediatrics is going to be more dictated on a, a dose. Again, it's going to be the 12 cc's per kilogram in pediatrics. In a way, that's really what adults should be giving as well. I mean, if you think about it, it should be no different. But we're going to be more concerned about replenishing those fluids so that we can maintain a good perfusion. So ultimately, you're just not just flooding, say, a whole liter of fluid into somebody who's got a good blood pressure, right? So we're wanting to just get, we're looking for the effect. If they've got, if they're hypotensive, then give them enough fluid to increase their blood pressure. Ultimately, again, we're looking for the MAP, mean arterial pressure, to maintain organ perfusion, especially in septic shock. That is huge. We, they get a lot of fluids. It, you, we don't have a septic shock protocol, but if you look at what the national standard is for septic shock, patients are getting, they're being treated 30 cc's per kilogram of fluid before they get a presser. And that's going to be, that's hospital, that's, that's pre-hospital and hospital treatments. So they're getting 30 cc's of fluid per kilogram. So you have a 220 pound patient, what's the kilogram? 100 kilograms times 30, they're getting three liters of fluid. Three liters. And we're lucky to get one liter sometimes before we even get to the hospital. Quarter lane, you're, you're not even getting a liter of fluid in because your transports are like two to five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. So something to think about. Bilateral IVs, that's why bilateral IVs is so important so we can get more fluid into that patient. Large bore IVs. Yeah. So, uh, in regards to this particular type of job, what instruments that it's up to have that have the different gears and stuff like that? I know we don't, we don't carry all our instruments like that, but that's in the drug that, or the fluid that stays in the, in the vessel that's falling through, correct? Yeah. Well, then there's the other issue, if you, if you start getting into this more, is what is the pH of these fluids that we're putting in? You know, the pH of normal saline is, I think, like 5.8, around 5.8, whereas lactated ringers, I believe, is in the sixes, like 6.2. Your body is 7.3. So when you're already acidotic, and now we're pushing all this fluid. So it's, it is, that is actually something that they've been looking into as a result, results to um, sepsis treat, treatments. What fluids is most appropriate for giving these patients? Again, we have to fill the container before we can use pressors, other medications. So with septic shock, they've been burning, their body has been metabolizing the fluids that's on the inside. That's why they're in this decompensated shock possibly. So they've been running the high fevers, their body is burning off, it's dehydrated. Other issues with metabolism of some of the organs is going to help uh, increase that hypoperfusion. So that's why it's important to fill that container as much as possible before you can actually start using pressors. Of course, that's like at a medic level, the hospital level. But think about it because this is the more that you guys know at your level and then what's going to be the next uh, – next the ongoing treatment for this patient is going to be better right if you know what the next treatment is you're going to potentially give that patient better treatment you're going to be able to educate that patient of what's going to be going on help them understand what's going to happen once they get to the hospital um, and knowing what that next level of care is going to be for you it might help dictate what type of treatments you're going to give Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Andy's question. Hold on. Twelve mil, no twenty. For pediatrics, it's twenty, twenty milliliters per kilogram. Does that make? Did I say twelve earlier? I thought I said twenty. So twenty. So it's based on protocol. Should be in the protocols. Twelve twenty cc's of fluid for pediatrics. 
That's kind of the typical for a fluid challenge. For a fluid challenge. That's the national standard for for pediatrics. For fluid replacement, yeah. For for pediatrics, fluid challenging for pediatrics is twenty mils per kilogram. Yes, correct, Andy. If I said twelve, I'm sorry. I meant twenty. Okay. So if vital signs, you get your vital signs after you have these IV fluids running, you get vital signs, your pressures uh, go back up, your heart rates come back down. Do you continue to leave the fluids running wide open? No, we want to make sure we drop that back down and maybe do a TKO rate. So we're slowing that down to keep vein open. We're doing a slow drip of the IV fluids just to keep that vein open. So we're, that's to prevent a clot in the line. Special considerations with fluid administration. You're only administering enough fluid to maintain radial pulses is what the book talks about. So you're trying to get those radial pulses. Using a Braslow tape or other reference for pediatrics, and some of those other references are going to be like the hand heavy. We use Braslow tape locally, though, so hand heavy. I mean, Braslow tape. Braslow tape. Carefully monitor the patient's status and, re and treat conservatively in instances of uncontrolled hemorrhage. Again, make sure you maintain, uh, you stop the bleed, and then uh, treat them conservatively. If they have a lot of blood loss and you're just flooding them with fluids, again, you're, you you got to have that balance of how much are you affecting. You're diluting the, the blood's ability to clot. So something to think about as you're treating this patient. And only way to maintain fetal perfusion in a uh, pregnant, uh, pregnancy is to aggressively treat the mother. So again, if that mother is that pregnant mother is hypo has hypoperfusion, the baby is not perfusing. So that is that is a critical critical thing. So make sure you treat the mother aggressively. Any other questions on medical care? All right. We're. Just you know, I'm waiting for Todd to give me the tide sign of when we put on move our vehicles. Okay. But we're sitting good now. They're, they're having a hard time getting the heavy snow off the whole lot. It's, a, it's wet and heavy. Oh. Uh, one of the other things with, uh, with pregnancies is just remember. Um, what is going to what potentially is causing that patient to become hypotensive if they're laying flat flat the weight pushing down so just positioning them putting them on that left recumbent left lateral recumbent position can help as well treating cardio oh let me go back one here let's see yeah so treating hypovolemic shock, obviously, again, controlling the bleed. I think you probably see the, the thing here. Control the bleed. You want to get at least one 18 gauge or larger peripheral line. So the thing with IV uh, catheters, go back and you have an opportunity. Go back to your uh, ambulances or to your engines, whatever. And when you're doing your, your truck checks, there is a flow rate based on each cage uh, catheter. Pay attention to that. Think about that because that's why they're wanting you to get an 18 gauge catheter or, or bigger because you're going to be able to flow a lot more fluid through that catheter in a shorter amount of time than you are going to be with the 20, 22, 24. So pay attention to what the, if, just look at it. It's going to be interesting. You'll find it interesting to see how much fluid you can actually flood through that 18 gauge catheter as opposed to a 20 gauge catheter. Securing and maintain an airway and provide respiratory support. It's always important. Monitor the patient's mental status, pulse rate, blood pressure. So again, you're looking for to make sure that the brain is perfusing for that mental status. You're looking for that pulse rate to hopefully decrease and that blood pressure to start to increase. And again, provide rapid transport. Doesn't necessarily mean that we need to be going code, but go with a purpose. Transport with a purpose. 
course, we don't, and this is something we we typically are pretty familiar with as well. Do not give the patient anything by mouth. So if they're altered, we don't want to give anything by mouth because then you they have the potential of choking, right? Aspirating. Um, yeah. But you end up getting some of those patients who are, they might, they're, again, might have that uh, sign of thirst. Giving them a little, maybe giving them, if they're alert, letting them have a little swish of water just to rinse the inside of the mouth might be very helpful. It's, it's just good patient care if that patient, just to make that patient a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable. Ensure systolic blood pressure is greater than 90 is for our immediate diagnostic goal. We're looking to get that blood pressure greater than 90 so that we can administer nitroglycerin. Make sure you have a line established. If you're teetering on that 90 to 100 systolic, make sure you get, probably make sure you get an IV access before you give nitro. I believe at the basic level, it's still 100. At the inter, uh, advanced and paramedic level, it's at 90, if I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly. Basics can't, just can't do it. Place a patient in a position of comfort and administer high flow oxygen. If this patient's got chest pain, uh, chest pressure, they may not be wanting to lay down flat, which potentially could help their blood pressure but it could cause them more breathing difficulty, anxiety, which is gonna make things worse. Provide prompt, prompt transport, gain IV access, minister fluid at a take, take, take you, TKO rate, just to keep that site open. Also, aspirin. Make sure you give aspirin in cardiogenic, right? We're giving aspirin for chest pain. Obstructive shock with that cardiac tamponade, you stab the chest, right? No. No stabbing the chest. Increase the cardiac output should be the priority. Apply high flow oxygen. So give them oxygen. There's not much that you're going to be able to do for the cardiac tamponade. Weigh the need for positive pressure ventilation against the possibility of hypoventilation. Only definitive treatment in surgery or pericardiocentesis is going to fix this patient. So rapid transport. This is a patient you might want to drive code to the hospital. And, but the big thing with this is early recognition, right? So available at pre-hospital providers. Treatment for us is early recognition and getting that patient rapidly to definitive care. Tension pneumo, apply high flow oxygen via a non-rebreather mask. Decompress the injured site of the chest. So this might be as simple as just pushing on that area of the chest to help burp it. You want to plug the hole. If, it's, uh, if there, there is a hole, plug the hole, but you want to consider burping it. Uh, maybe get ALS to decompress the chest. Gain IV access and administer fluid at a take you. Take you. TKO rate. Pulmonary embolus, assess the blood pressure, provide IV fluids at a 250 milliliter of some crystalloid solution. So we're going to give them a 250 bolus of saline. Rapid transport, provide respiratory support. Patient may breathe more comfortably in an upright or partially upright position. So upright or, you know, at, a, at a, some Fowler's position. And again, with this, definitive care. We're not going to be able to really do anything in the field. So recognizing the issue, rapid transport, managing airway, getting that IV access, getting to the hospital so that they can get uh, some TPA, something to break up that clot. Septic shock is going to be important for us to also recognize. All this is important for us to recognize. That's for 
for really the, mo the most important thing for any of these is early recognition. So early recognition of septic shock, use appropriate standard precautions and transport as promptly as possible. If it's due to an infection, you want to protect yourselves against that infection because it could be, it could be an uh, MRSA, right? So think about that. So if it's a MRSA infection, we want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. We don't know what the infection is. If it's respiratory, some type of respiratory bacteria, think about if this patient is sick and they're in septic shock, maybe actually wearing a surgical mask or an N95 mask to help protect your airway. High flow oxygen for this patient, maintain IV access, consider a second line, and it's gonna, this patient needs a lot of fluid in order to maintain radio pulses. So it's a, a guideline. Yeah. So I've <laughs> I've had we've had a pressure of 77 systolic and still felt a radio pulse, but as a guideline. Yeah, ball, ballpark, ballpark. Chief, any any input on that? No. Yeah, ballpark. Treating neurogenic shock, emergent transport must be directed at obtaining and maintaining a proper airway. Provide spinal immobilization, so C-spine precautions, assist inadequate breathing as needed, conserve body heat, which is gonna be very important with this patient as well, and provide the most effective circula uh, circulation, providing the most effective circulation possible. So try and do the best you can. Provide circulatory uh, support with uh, IV and fluids. Transport, this patient is gonna be a priority transport. This patient possibly is going to be a priority to trauma as well. Think about that. So when you notify the hospital, possibly a priority one, depending on your situation. Anaphylactic shock is going to be treated with epi, subcutaneous or intramuscular. So for us, for you, follow the protocols for the dose for epi, whether it's an adult or pediatric. So for an adult, it's going to be that 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams IM. So you're going to draw that up, filter needle through the with the ampule. You're going to draw that up and then switch the filter needle out with a needle that you can actually administer IM medication and then hit them in the arm or the leg with that medication. Make sure you don't give an IM medication IV, which would be bad. 0.3 milligrams of 1 to 1,000 IV is going to cause cardiac issues. Promptly transport this patient and provide all possible support. So again, you're going to be trying to get IV access because initially with this, this patient needs epi rapidly. So they're not going to, typically, you're not going to worry about trying to get that IV immediately. You're going to be trying to get that patient that IM medication, that epi on board into the muscle. You're going to provide them oxygen support and then try to get them IV access and start giving them some fluids. With uh, anaphylaxis, it's important to try to determine what's causing it so that obviously for documentation and, and uh, notifying the hospital. And keep in mind that even a mild reaction can worsen. Okay. Psychogenic shock, record initial observe observations of vital signs and level of consciousness. Try to get information from bystanders. Try to figure out what from the bystanders, because this patient might have just uh, had a syncope. So with this psychogenic shock, this patient might have, might have a syncope. They might be a little altered. So you may not be able to get the best information from that patient so trying to get that information, find out from bystanders, family, facility, staff, what was going on before this patient fainted, how long he or she's been out, unresponsive, unconscious. Try to figure out, that, figure out all that information. And this shock can worsen other types of shock. So they might be having some other issues, uh, but psychogenic shock can substitute substantially worsen other types of shock. Respiratory insufficiency, immediately seal any hole in the chest, right? So we want to make sure we plug the holes, 
Stabilize impaled objects in the chest. Secure and maintain the airway and administer supplemental oxygen. It's all real basic stuff. And determine the need to assist ventilations because they might not be able to breathe adequately on their own or they might be breathing too fast. So consider using a BVM on high flow to try to help assist those ventilations. Any questions on assessing and management of the shock? Yay, nay, no? Online? John, Andy, Coulter? Nay. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, so we're going to take a little break, and then uh, we'll come back and just cover the skill sheets of IV access, medication administration, and then pediatric IO. All right? You guys, take five. Or 10. It's 10.17. We'll be back at 10.30. All right. So catch that, guys. So we'll be back at uh, 10.30 recording. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah, so on and in ESO, which is difficult, which I'm, I'm it would be nice if we had this like the name with say like student afterward, afterwards because I know that was the issue that we had with pipe off is they're both names, but when we go to select the name, we don't know which one it is. So you actually have to select both of them in order for it to, to pop up. There's no differentiation in ESO unless you go to the actual form, like once it's all done, because it's going to say what this your status is afterwards. But in the listing of employees, of care providers, it doesn't differentiate which one's a student name and which one is not. So if, if we could get that fixed, that would be extremely helpful. But, or, or ultimately, you select both names when you go to, so when you're out in the field and you are able to start actually doing these whenever that is, it's up to Scott. So as of right now, no, but then go back to your department and figure that out with Scott and your department when you are allowed to do your IVs. So practice on arms, the training arms. Maybe you get to op maybe you're allowed to practice on each other. So, but in the field, the the, the field is going to be different. So you can go back to the, probably go back to the stations and practice IVs on each other, but going out and doing it in the field is going to be dependent on on Scott's approval and. Hopefully Scott Scott should send out an email possibly to everybody to, to so that everybody has that in the email form because yeah all right so IV's next set yes Coulter not on patients but Jaderquist Jaderquist says he's gonna give you an arm uh, yeah there you go. Taylor. Taylor says he'll give up an arm too. I'll switch to station three and then I'll let him go. Right. Except yes, Coulter. Jada Chris will be at station three. So back to four. Back. Or back to four. Yeah, he's going to four. No docking. Okay. So let's go over. Let's go over the skill sheets. We're going to cover the uh, two skill sheets here kind of a line by line, how it should look as far as for the test, and then we're gonna call it a day. So the skill sheets, there's two of them that you'll get tested on. One is gonna be the IV therapy, which is gonna be the IV portion, and then bolus medication. So with this, let's see if I can just make it a little bit bigger. 
Boom. God. Seriously? Okay. No, I heard the comment. Oh, yeah, all right. The mic didn't pick it up, though, so you got that going for you. All right. So with this skill sheet, you're going to have everything laid out on the table, and you're going to have possibly uh, multiple, two different macro drip sets. You'll have your IV fluids. You'll have multiple IV catheters. You're going to have the rest of your equipment. So then tourniquet, tape, 4 by 4s alcohol prep, and tegaderms. So you're going to have everything that you would need for a IV start. To start off with, you're going to need to check the fluids. Make sure the, it's the proper fluid. Make sure you have the right the, the clarity. And you need to verbalize all this stuff. So I'm going to ensure that I have the proper IV solutions. I'm going to use normal saline. It's the proper fluid. It's got It's clear. There's no floaties in it. And that there it, it is within the expiration date. It's not expired. You're going to select the appropriate catheter. So, you, again, you're going to have IV catheters out on the table. So you're going to I, – all right, I got my IV catheter, 18-gauge, appropriate drip set. I'm going to use – as an adult patient, I'm going to use a macro drip set. It's going to be a 15-drop per milliliter, and I'm going to spike my bag. Make sure that you fill the drip chamber and then flush the line. Again, if you're when you're doing this, just to make it simple – that macro drip set is going to be open. The roller is going to be in an open position when you pull it out of the bag. So when you open that up, open that, take the macro drip out of the bag, close that roller, let's close the tubing, then spike your bag, fill the drip chamber, give it a couple little squeezes to fill that drip chamber about halfway, then open up the roller. What the roller is I'm, I'm referring to. Okay, so open up the roller and open up that bag. So then it's going to flush that air completely out of that line. You're not going to get a whole bunch of bubbles. If you don't close that roller before you spike the bag, you're going to get multiple bubbles within the tubing, and it's just going to be a pain in the butt to try to get that the air bubbles out. Okay, so close the close the roller, spike the bag, fill the drip chamber, a couple squeezes to get it about halfway in the drip chamber. Then open up the line to flood the air out of the bag. Make sure you cut uh, or tear a couple pieces of tape. You're going to have an opportunity to put that tape on, say, on the table or just stick it to uh, the IV uh, pole or wherever is appropriate. Verbalize that you're doing, doing PP, uh, PPE, so PP, Cena safe. Make sure... Th probably should make sure you're doing this with gloves on before you do anything else because everything is supposed to be sterile, right? So make sure you probably put gloves on before you get into any of this. Do it. I, I honestly, the way I would prefer you do that with every single skill, skill sheet. If you, cause it, again, that is one of the things that people miss when on some of these skill sheets where it's required. So if you just go into a skill station and say, okay, BSI scene safe, whether it's on the sheet or not, you're going to be covered every single time. I mean, it's kind of going overboard, but BSI scene safe. All right, I'm going to get my gloves on. I'm going to do all this stuff. Okay. Yes. Um, apply the tourniquet to the hand or the arm, whichever you're going to have as far as your testing or your practice. Apply the tourniquet. Palpate for a suitable vein. So I'm going to be applying the tourniquet. Borrow your arm, Chad. Beautiful. I'm going to apply the tourniquet. Make sure it's nice and tight so it gets those veins to start popping up. You had veins a second ago. Um, you shunted when I approached you, I guess. All right. Defense, Defense mechanism. Sure. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to palpate for that, that vein. Remember, you, you're, look, you're feeling for that spongy or uh, that uh, springy. Uh, sight on a on your testing arms and hands they're going to be pretty obvious pretty obvious if you miss those then something's wrong don't ever start it on a live person then okay so you're going to be feeling that spring uh, springy vein 
So you're palpating that suitable vein. Then once you locate that vein, you're going to cleanse the site. Take your alcohol prep, cleanse the site appropriately. Okay? In the field, you will experience patients that you need to cleanse it with more than just one alcohol prep. Because you go to cleanse it and it's all of a sudden it's dark brown or black and it's like, oh my gosh. They are, their skin's a little bit more pale than this. Got it. So maybe as a, just, just pay attention to that because again, we were trying to prevent infection. Okay. As soon as we palp, uh, puncture that, that, uh, site, try to prevent infection. So cleanse it appropriately. Insert the, uh, IV, the, the catheter, the needle. So you're going to be inserting the needle at say at an angle, like 45 degree angle going down into the vein and you're looking for a flash. So you're looking for a flash, you're getting blood return into that flash chamber of the catheter. So it's important as you're holding that arm and you're getting that, that uh, uh, needle into the arm that you're not covering up the flash chamber because you're preventing the opportunity to see when you actually do get that flash. If you cover up the uh, flash chamber and you just go for it, Potentially, you you might go all the way through the vein before you realize that you have a flash. Okay, so remember though, once you get that flash, that initial flash, you need to then drop down that needle to about a 15 degree angle, is according to the book. Just drop that down and advance it a few more millimeters so that you're actually getting the catheter piece into the vein. It's important bevel up and you still have a couple millimeters of needle, sharp needle before that actual plastic catheter. So drop it down to 15 degrees and advance it a couple millimeters into the vein. Once you have it into the vein, then you advance. You can just push because there's a little lip on top of the catheter. Push that catheter forward into the vein and then occlude the vein. So I'm gonna occlude the vein above where that catheter went in. So if my site, I went into the hand here, I have advanced the catheter, which means I'm pushing the catheter up into the vein and not allowing the, the metal, the actual needle to advance. Once I get that all the way, hopefully you're getting that all the way up to the hub, to the, the skin up, the hub down to the skin, then you're going to occlude. So I've got the vein, the puncture site's here. I'm gonna occlude just to about where that tip of the catheter is to stop the blood flow back into the catheter. So I'm not bloodletting my patient. Remove the needle and then connect your IV tubing. Whatever, if, if you're using the macro drip set for just the skill sheet or you're using an extension set out in the field, okay? Connect the tubing, dispose of the sharps, in a proper container, so I'm gonna make sure I dispose the sharp. So when you're doing this in the skill sheet, I don't know if you, whoever, whoever you're seeing me here. So when you're doing this in the skill sheet, you're going to puncture, occlude, remove the, while holding the catheter, I'm gonna hold the catheter in place, remove the sharps, dispose of the sharps, connect my tubing, open up my uh, line, remove the tourniquet, not necessarily in that order, maybe remove the tourniquet first, and then open up the line to make sure that I'm getting blood or fluid flow. And then I'm gonna secure the site with, with uh, my tegaderm and the tape. And then I'm going to adjust my flow to the appropriate rate, whether it's wide open or TKO. So you wanna make sure you are adjust the flow rate as appropriate. So just, I'm gonna adjust the flow TKO if I don't need to flow fluids or I'm gonna leave it wide open if I need to flow fluids into this patient. So that is the top portion of this skill sheet. Some of the critical failures, what I typically see, cause I've, I've helped uh, test this with uh, for the National Registry, the, some of the typical failures is, honestly is actually not as common, but I've seen people not wear gloves or talk about BSI, at least talk about BSI, but just, just wear gloves for the skill sheet. I've never had anybody not get this within the three, uh, three attempts or within six minutes. That's not an issue, but I've also seen where 
they're not releasing the tourniquet. So if you're doing this skill sheet and the proctor is going to say, what's, <laughs> you have the IV, you've got the flow, everything's going, you've finished, what you think you've finished is the skill sheet. You've got flow, but that IV, the, the proctor is going to say, no, you don't have flow. They're going to tell you, you don't have flow. That means you probably have a tourniquet still attached to the arm. Okay, just remember, tourniquets need to be released. Even though you see a flow and the, the, pro, or the proctor that's as grading you is saying, no, you don't have flow, you don't have flow, but I'm looking at the drip chamber and it's flowing. Look back at your arm, look for the blue constricting band, release the constricting band. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. As long as you get that tourniquet off. The idea is that you need to leave the uh, tourniquet on until you get that needle into the vein, the, the catheter into the vein. So it's because it's building up the backflow. It's making that vein a little bit easier for that needle to puncture and for you to advance that, the catheter. Chief? I was just going to say, you, this is really muscle memory. And so I 100% urge you to get an IV arm out and do it over and over and over and over. So the components of it are in your head. It's going to be the problem solving that's going to derail you and you'll forget the muscle memory of it. So if it's permanently in your head, the, the skills and the order that you do stuff, when you do have a problem, you can solve the problem and get right back into your line of doing things. Yeah. And you're going to learn what's easiest for you, whether you advance all the way when you do your IV rounds of tubing, the more you put in and the more you see the field of flow and how do you advance, you do a two finger advance or your thumb advance. I mean, that's totally what you're used to and you're comfortable with. That'll come through redundant practice. So if you guys didn't hear that on online, so Chief Isaac was just reiterating that this is, this skill is going to ultimately revolve around muscle memory, going through the skill over and over and over and get it through a technique that is acceptable but that works for you. That still gets the skill done. Skill done. Uh, anything else? Let's see. Online, you guys have any other any questions? The other thing, and you'll see this on this on this skill sheet for the critical fails. It, it talks about that catheter shear. And we talked about that on Monday, what catheter shear. It's when you, with the practice arm, it's not necessarily realistic. It gives you kind of a false sense of hope to an extent, unfortunately. So you get in there, you drop it down, you advance the catheter, and it advances beautifully. But when you get out in the field or you're practicing in the station or you're at the, the hospital doing rounds, you're going to get those valves, and you're going to try to advance it. and it doesn't advance. And then you're going to want to pull that back. And remember, as soon as you try to pull that catheter back over the needle, that is when you're potentially going to cause a uh, catheter shear. Okay. So be careful with that. The other thing is uh, that I've seen where somebody drops it in, they get the flash and they don't really advance the catheter enough. Again, is that needle punctures the vein, but if you don't advance that needle far enough, that vein is going to prevent the catheter from advancing through. Okay, so just be careful, careful with that. You may need to make sure that you do get two, three millimeters extra advanced. Let me show you, let me show these guys on your hand. Okay. Standard. One of the things you're going to find, you're going to find these little tricks that are kind of fun, and you do a lot of IVs. You're going to get really good at finding veins. So if Bo were clamped off right now, what places I go are like the intern vein. This is a marvelously secure vein. It doesn't roll very well. So, or the back of the hand. So if we're going to do a simple back of the hand, I really get the patient to wrap their fingers around my finger. And then you see what my thumb is doing? It's pulling traction on that upper level of skin. So now I'm pulling a little bit advancing, looking for flashback, flashback thumbs. Don't let go of your thumb. 
to advance. The minute you do that, exactly what Mo was just talking about is going to happen. So when you keep that traction with your thumb and you get in and you advance, you can get that one finger or thumb advance or hold now the traction with the other hand and advance it that way. But you'll you'll have to do that like holding hands with you. Nah, I'm fine with it. But you'll I'm have secure. to do it on the arm and then do it in your technique practice at the hospital. Thanks, Mo. Yeah. You know, again, like Chief is saying, it's there's going to be different <laughs> different techniques. Skin people are built differently. We've we've talked about that, right? So you're going to experience different types of skin. You're going to experience the old thin skin that is just weird, and it's you're going to be pulling. It's like, man, I really have to pull, and it's almost like paper that you're just pulling. And like Chief's saying, when you pull that traction, make sure you're not pulling traction between the knuckle. Pull traction over the top of the knuckle because the the vein's not over the top, but it's going to be between the knuckles. If you pull traction here, you might affect the blood flow going into the vein. That's the other issue that I see with when you're pulling traction in the field is even like in an AC, when you have the tourniquet up here, up in the upper arm, and they go to pull traction, but then you start occluding the vein below where you need to advance the catheter. And now all of a sudden you had a vein, now I've lost the vein because I've stopped the blood flow. So just be careful where you're applying traction. Um, walked out, are you doing these on people or make-believe? We're in make-believe land, Eric. So we're in make-believe land. Uh, we're working on getting Scott to send out an email. Just text me back, Scott, and you can reiterate. Okay. Scott will be sending an email to everybody explaining the process for field trial and then we'll send you an email and then you can send an email. All right, so Scott's going to be sending out an email to clearly give direction on utilizing IV access out in the field. So from here, you're probably going to be able to do IV access as on obviously on training arms and around the station. But when it comes to patients, that's a different animal. And wait for the email from Scott to, to clearly give you direction on what that's going to look like, when, and where, how, and documentation piece. OK? Make believe land. I like make believe land. All right, no more questions there. So now with this, it's kind of a new thing. When I did my intermediate, uh, we didn't have the IV bolus medication piece. So this is a new piece um, that has been on the skill sheets for several years now. So once you have your IV access, you're finished that piece. Now you go down to actually administering medications. What medications are you allowed to administer IV? D50 and Narcan? Narcan? No, I don't think so. I think only uh, intranasally. Intranasally is only it? Okay. I don't have the scope. Somebody want to pull up the protocols to make sure. Cause or D5, D50. So I know on the skill or for your skills lab for the testing, they're going to have the more than likely going to have D50. But I've also seen other medications laid out. Make sure you're using the appropriate medication because that's going to be part of it right here, right? So ask the patient for known allergies. Always important before you give patients medications. Ask for allergies. Obviously, this is just an arm or a hand that you're doing an IV on, but you need to at least verbalize. I need to ask the patient for any allergies. I'm going to select the appropriate medication for the treatment that I want to give based on my great patient assessment. I'm going to ensure that the correct concentration of that medication is going to be given. I'm going to verify which, what the concentration is. Assembles pre-filled syringe correctly and dispels air. So this is going to be your D50. Pop in the yellow caps, double thumbs. Pop them, put it together. Continues to take and verbalize appropriate PPE precautions. It's it's silly, but it's on the skill sheet. Just say I'm still got BSI on. I still got my my gloves on. BSI scene safe. Identifies and cleans the injection site closest to the patient. It's the Y port or the hub. So if you're using an extension set alone, which obviously for the skill sheet you're not, um, it's just a little 
uh, hub or if it's the Y port on the macro drip set. You're going to have a Y port where you're going to have your um, lure lock hub that you need to connect into. Make sure you clean it. Remember we talked about this on Monday where that, that little piece of that hub potentially could still have, could get bacteria, junk, whatever. As soon as, if you don't clean it, as soon as you connect up medication, a syringe, you're going to be pushing that junk into the patient, which would be bad. So that's why we need to make sure we clean it. Clean it with a little alcohol prep, clean it once. Even though you just did it, just clean it. The medication, okay, so I am, yes, I am giving D50. I'm gonna stop the IV flow, whether you pinch the line or you close the roller. I'm gonna stop the IV flow. So typically the best way is just to pinch the line closest to that Y hub or that Y port. Pinch the line above where you're going to be injecting that into the line, right? Not below. Administer correct dose. So if I'm giving only, if what am I giving? Am I giving 12 and a half milligrams or am I giving a full 25 milligrams? So half, so whatever. You're just gonna give the uh, appropriate amount, right? Administers the correct dose at the proper push rate. So with D50, it's a hard push anyways. So it's not like you can slam that, but only one real medication is a fast IV push and that's adenosine. So it's not, everything else typically is gonna be a slow push. So just do a nice, slow, uh, easy push. Once it's administered, you need to dispose or verbalize proper disposal of that syringe or needle in the proper container. Obviously, if we're only giving half, we're not going to throw that away immediately. But just for the skill, I'm going to administer D50, and then I'm going to dispose of the syringe in the sharps container. I'm going to turn the IV on or just release that pinch to allow that medica the medication to flow in. Remember, I've pushed that medication into that Y port, but depending on how long it is between that Y port and the end of that catheter to where it actually goes in, it's at the end of the vein, you might have a lot of that medication still in the vein. So it's important that you flush that line. Make sure you get a good flush of that line with the uh, solution, IV solution to get the rest of that medication into the vein. Adjust the drip rate. Do I want it wide, wide open again or do I want it at TKO? And then I want to verbalize the need to observe the patient for desired effects. This is a piece that actually I've seen that people fail where they say, okay, I administer it. I've disposed of the IV and then I reopen my line. Done. Wrong. You're not done. You need to make sure that you're looking for the proper effects. Am I getting a return of consciousness from this patient? What, what effects am I looking for based on the medication that I gave? So I'm looking, and all you have to do for the skill sheet is say, I'm going to verbalize the need to observe, uh, I'm going to observe the patient for desired effects and any adverse side effects. Because remember, the medication we're giving, we have a, a desired effect, but there's also those nasty side effects that a patient can potentially have. You need to be aware of those and watch out for them. For documentation. Critical fails on this, not getting it done within the three minute time frame. It's not a big deal. I've not seen anybody have any issues with this because it's pretty simple. You already have your IV access. All it is is, Again, making sure you go through those allergies. Make sure you go through the allergies. Identify any allergies before. Do it a couple times. Just like doing the uh, reaffirming the medication. I'm going to ask for any allergies. I'm going to make sure I have the appropriate medication. You go through your stuff. Before I administer it, I'm going to – so allergies, no, no allergies to D50, great. And I'm going to ensure that it is D50 that I am pushing. So those are a couple of things that I've seen with people failing, not – doing the allergies, not reassuring that that's the met, right medication a couple times, and then opening up the line to the appropriate drip rate. Oh, nice. I just saw the perfect error. That, that seems fair. Uh, oh, right Yeah. Eric Church says, bring it. He's got plenty of veins for you. All right. So any questions on IV 
therapy, and then medication. Really, again, this is like Chief Eisen saying, this is just basically it's a regurgitation of that information. Any of these skill sheets, it's just a regurgitation of the information on that skill sheet. Memorize the skill sheet, make it work in a flow that works for you to make sure that you hit all the critical stuff and none of the critical fails. Just regurgitate it, get it done. Okay. All right. The next one is going to be pediatric IO. And this one is going to be set up typically at the same station. This is usually the ones that I've, I've tested. This is all at the same station. So when you go to test out on this, you have IV access, medication administration, and then further down on the table, you're going to have your pediatric leg to where you're going to use your pediatric IO. A lot of this is going to be set up in the top half of this, similar to establishing your IV access. So depending on your proctor, they may not have you redo everything that you just they just saw you do. We already saw you do looking at the bag, making sure you had the right equipment, spike the bag, all that. Um, they may not make you do all that stuff. Again, it depends on the proctor. I've seen it both ways where some it's rare. But somebody has you do the entire skill sheet, even though they saw some of this already. So again, you're going to make sure you select your proper fluid. I'm going to, it's the proper fluid. It's for pediatric, I might use, uh, maybe it's D5. And I'm going to ensure that it's uh, got the proper clarity. There's no floaties in it. It's within the expiration date. I'm going to select the appropriate equipment to include an IO, syringe, saline, and extension set with a three-way stopcock. And then you're going to select the appropriate administration set. Remember, with pediatrics, this is where we want to go with a micro drip set as opposed to a macro drip set. So you're going to get that 60 drops per milliliter. It's easier to control the flow on those pediatrics, pediatrics so you don't overload them. Connects administration set to the bag. Administer sets, fill the drip chamber, flush the tubing, just like with the IV access. You're going to prepare the syringe and the extension set tubing or three-way stopcock. So with this, you're going to open up the extension tubing, which is just that little, we all know, the, we see the extension tubing in the field. And you're going to have a saline flush, and you're going to flush the air out of that extension set. Just preparing that, because once you get the IO access, that's going to be the first thing you connect. Okay. Make sure you have tape ready uh, before you before you do the IO puncture. So this is honestly in back on the IV access. That is one piece that I've seen people fail. It's a, make sure you have tape torn and ready before you do your IV access. In the field, typically we have that because somebody else is preparing it for us. You're not going to have the luxury of that for the testing site. So make sure you have tape ahead of time. When you first walk in, do tape straight out the gate. Get gloves on and do your tape. Done. Tape and gloves are done. So uh, the other equipment for this with the IO is also you're going to have possibly uh, you're going to have rolled gauze for stabilizing that IO. Ensure that you're verbally saying, hey, I still have my PPE on identifies the proper anatomic site for the IO. So you're going to have a baby with legs and a chicken bone maybe or whatever they have set up for your IV access. You're going to identify the tibial tuberosity. Go below that tibial tuberosity to the proper site. You're going to stabilize, clean the site, stabilize the, uh, the leg. Go at a 90 degree angle to the site. Make sure you're using the pediatric IO needle, which is going to be the pink needle. Stabilize. Make sure that you're not holding the leg on the backside. I, if you go all the way through the leg through your hand, that's impressive. But, <laughs> but it is a critical fail for this skill sheet. Do not put your hand behind, directly behind where your needle is going to be going. Okay. The other thing with that, here's the thing, truly, is if you're holding that leg and you're here and for whatever reason you slip, you're going to be drilling your hand. Okay. So stabilize the tibia. 
again, make sure once you cleanse the site, don't touch it with anything else. The next thing you should touch is that site is the needle. You're going to puncture the skin and then you're going to advance that with the easy IO, drill it until you get that pop or according to the skill sheet until you get that pop. If you're using the jam sheety, the manual, and you get that twisting, you're going to twist and turn until you get the pop. Or notice a sudden lack of resistance. There you go. Remove the stylet, so it's gonna you're gonna unscrew the stylet out of the I/O. Dispose of it into the proper container. Now, for this skill sheet for the test, you're not gonna dispose of it into a sharps container or into the actual sharps uh, protection device that comes with the needles. You're gonna at least verbalize because we're more than likely gonna have to reuse that needle for the next test. Okay, but you would need to make sure that you verbalize at least, I'm gonna dispose of the needle into a sharps container. Attach the syringe and extension set to the IO aspirates, so you're gonna draw back a little, or attach a three-way stopcock between the administration set and IO needle and aspirate. Or attach the extension set to an IO needle, aspirates. Aspiration is not required for the dry stick. So with this testing, you're probably just going to be told it's going to be a dry stick, so you don't need to do an aspiration. You just connect up the extension set, flush, slowly inject that third to bottom line, slowly inject the saline to assure proper placement of the needle, adjust the flow rate and bolus. Remember, pediatrics, 20, cc, 20 cc's per kilogram, and then secure the needle and support with bulky dressing. So that's going to be your rolled gauze, tape, around that to help secure it. Questions on IO. Again, with the IO, it's got it's a pediatric IO. It's going to be the same type of deal if you have to do an uh, adult IO in the field. Pediatric is going to be a little bit, probably a little bit more you're probably going to have a little bit more anxiety with with a pediatric IO because again, remember that they're so tiny, right? They have the small bones. The biggest thing that you need to consider when you're doing a pediatric IO is proper placement, because again, the goal for us is to do no harm. If you go in the wrong spot with the IO in a pediatric and hit that growth plate, you're going to do permanent damage to that pediatric, okay? So make sure you're fully aware of your anatomic sites and making sure you're in the right spot for applying those IOs. Any questions? Any questions? No? Online, you guys have any other questions? Eric, Andy, anybody who is still awake or? No, Coulter, good seeing you, good seeing you. Practice on the arms. Practice. So Friday, Scott's here, and he begins the process of practicing. All right. So for everybody online, so Scott's going to be here Friday and going to be working on the uh, practicing skills for this. He's rolling out the AED and some other stuff as well, but he'll have arm here practice. So Friday, Friday's going to be AEDs and some CPR possibly, but then they're going to do practice arms. Scott's bringing practice arms for people to practice with. So, and then the skill is cardiac arrest APD, and he'll review the IV. Perfect. So if you're able to show up on Friday, great. You're actually going to start pushing, uh, pushing IO or IVs in a practice arm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good evening and good night. Hey, make sure you got everybody's name on the attendance roster, Mo, so I can send a picture to Scott. Did you